Hi everyone, it's Plastic EP and Vicky Show. Hi right everyone. Right now, we've got a very special guest, Tony Barrel, coming in from the UK, and we love him. He's a Beatle author. He's got two fantastic Beatle books. We'll go through that in a moment. But let me ask you, Tony, are you yeah. feeling groovy? Yeah, I, I'm always feeling groovy. You know, it's, um, <laughs> so I'm not feeling groovy. I'm feeling down. You know, so uh, I'm feeling groovy today. It's a groovy day in London. The sun. Hey, bananas, we feel groovy. Hey, bananas, we want you groovy. Want you groovy. Drive your tune buggies everywhere. Just going crazy without a care. Hey, bananas, we think you groovy. Right, straight into today. Now, you've got two fantastic Beatle books. We want all the Beatle world out there to have a look. Show us the book, Vicky. There it is. The Beatles on the roof. And I've got to tell you, it's available everywhere in bookstores here in Australia. I've seen it. And it's a big international seller there, Tony. And also yeah. know that you've got the Japanese version, if you'd like to show us that. Yeah, yeah. This is the Japanese version, which has been translated lovingly into uh, a language I can't understand, but uh, it looks beautiful. Um, it, uh, um, you know, it's, it's remarkable. I've never had, you know, opens the other way. Uh, I've never had a book uh, published in Japan before. So this is this is the first for me. Um, yeah, those are people. Now the second book, I want you to go through the second book because that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk about Beatlemania now? Yeah, show us that. Yeah, yeah. This is Beatlemania, which came out at the end of last year. It's uh, basically, we opened four photographic archives, um, four photographers who are no long, sadly no longer with us, but uh, Terry O'Neill, Norman Parkinson, Michael Ward, and Derek Bays. And there are nearly 200 books. Uh, sorry, uh, can I start again on that one? There are yeah, nearly 200 cool. photographs in this book, um, right. that many of which have never been seen before, of the Beatles you know, at work and, and, at, at, work and at play. And yeah, um, towards the end, there are some pictures of the Beatles filming um, Help. And they're walking around Mayfair in London. And they're in the street. And they've been photographed by this guy who's just come out of his office with a camera. And he's just just photographing them in the street as they walk along. Uh, that, this, that was uh, 1965. You could do that in those days. You can't just, you know, you can't just turn up with your camera and, and shoot during the, the shooting of a film nowadays, can you? And, yeah, but uh, I'm sure, Tony, in 1965, if you said, hey, boys, do you want a drink? Let's go inside and have a cup of tea or something. They might have said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? I said, in 1965, you might have asked them to go inside a cafe if they want a cup of tea or a drink, they might have come in. They, yeah, they they were cool about that. The Beatles were so cool about their their fame and everything. I mean, I mean, the fame I think became a problem after a few years, and they wanted to more anonymity. But um, they were mostly cool about it, and they, and they didn't mind. You know, so they weren't hassled too much. They were they were very relaxed. <clears throat> That's the way to be famous, I think. <clears throat> Excuse me. Exactly. And I'm going to ask you with the big book, right? Is that selling for around twenty five pounds? It's called what? Beatlemania, is it? Uh, yeah, it's um, it, it it's a it varies, it varies across the world, but I think it's uh, about twenty five pounds in in UK. Yeah, but that's really good value. What is it over two hundred and fifty pages? Is it? Uh, yeah, about two hundred and fifty pages. Uh, nearly two hundred photographs, um, and and some of them haven't been seen. You know, never been seen before. Some of them have rarely been seen, and. Uh, it was fantastic to do the research, to be presented with these mysterious photos. And what are the Beatles doing here? Because some of the photographers, you know, don't give you enough notes. You know, they just snap and walk away. So you've got to figure out what's going on, where they are, and, and so on. And um, the ones taken around Liverpool uh, in the early days, before they were famous across the country, are fantastic. And it was during that shoot there um, that um, the whole jelly bean uh, business was revealed you know people threw jelly beans at them and, and it started in in the uk with jelly babies which are uh, i don't think you ha have in america no, we've got jelly or, babies but let me tell you in the us they're harder lollies and if they hit in your eye 
You can lose an eye, and that's why George. Yeah, that's what George there. Harrison said. He said, you know, I I got hit in the eye with one, and it wasn't funny. You know, it was. Um, anyway, the whole Jelly Baby thing seems to have started when they were interviewed in Liverpool doing this photo shoot, and um, they were talking about the things that the fans had sent sent them. And John Lennon said, "Yeah, um, they, they sent me a load of Jelly Babies, uh, but he ate them all." Pointing to George, pointing to George Harrison. <laughs> so George got the blame, you know, for for eating the Jelly Babies, and he. The fans then read this in a magazine and and it was spread around the world that George Harrison likes jelly babies. So they were <laughs> flinging jelly babies at him in, in the UK. When they went over to America, they had jelly beans, which was the nearest equivalent. So ah, they were well, flinging they're jelly babies. And they're much harder. Much like bullets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly. So they were, yeah. you know, it was I think it's one of the reasons they gave they gave up touring in the end, because they were still getting the odd jelly baby thrown at them. You know, I don't blame you, but let me tell you this now: your books are available in all great bookstores and and on the net, the best platforms. What is yeah, it? you Amazon, can get them on the office, in the obvious online places. You know, you can get them wherever you look, really. Um, and uh, it's been such a joy to to write them because um, you know I've been a fan since I was very small. You know, as a kid, when I heard that they played the rooftop. And uh, the day after, and I didn't know, and I was just really, really, really upset, really angry. Actually, they hadn't told me they were playing. <laughs> I was like a little kid in short trousers, and this boy <laughs> said to me, "They played this. They played their place in London yesterday. It was a surprise." And I thought, well, "Why didn't they tell me?" You know, I'm one of their biggest fans. <laughs> you know, I was really upset. How old were you then? <laughs> So yeah, so that's why I wrote. That's why I wrote the Beatles on the on the roof. Um, it was a, a labour of love, really. I, I wanted to know more about that concert, and I wanted to uh, uh, to meet people and to interview people who were there at the time. So you know, I got um, Debbie Wellham, who was their receptionist at, at uh, Number Three Savile Row. Uh, she saw it all happening. She it was all happening around her. I spoke to Michael Lindsay Hogg, who directed the original film, the Let It Be film, including the rooftop. I spoke to Peter Brown, who was one of their managers. I spoke to uh, some of the cameramen there. I spoke to the people who were setting up the, the equipment on the roof in the, the in the morning, you know. And uh, I even got three of the policemen who turned up to uh, to stop the show. So, and some of the tailors who were working around Savile Row because it's a tailoring street, as you probably know. Um, and uh, it's. It was such a, an iconic event and such a strange event. You know, no other band uh, ha, has done that, you know, suddenly appear in public without any announcement and play completely new songs because that's what I they were. I also got to tell you that my friend Leslie Cavendish, who was yeah. hairdresser of the Beatles in 1966, he yeah. went up to the rooftop, but they wouldn't let him on, and he was standing underneath one floor, underneath yeah. the Apple building. And I don't yeah. know if you've read his book right, but this is a fantastic yeah. book, The Cutting Edge. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. Cavendish. Have you read it? Yeah, I, 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 I haven't, haven't actually read that book yet. But I, I see, again, it's one of those books I see around a lot. So I'll have to, uh, I'll have to, to, get, to get that. Now, Tony, I just got to ask you, how long did it take for you to write each one of those Beatle books? Right, The Beatles on the Roof. Um, well, I, it, it took about a, a, a year of research, and that includes interviews. I was... Um, writing i was i was desperately email emailing people you know hoping that they'd get back to me people like kevin harrington who was kind of in charge of the equipment that day he very kindly got back to me and 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 you know some of the policemen were hard to find and to track down and the fans in the street of course they were the hardest of all because you've got to find people who have shared their accounts somewhere you've got to find them and then you through word of mouth i found other people so it took a year to do all the research and to find all the people that i wanted to interview and to interview them and then i, I guess it took about six months to write the book as well so a year and a half for that one um the i mean this is most beatlemania is mostly a photographic book so you know all the work was done really uh, apart from you know figuring out you know exactly what the disease the detail of the photographs was so uh you know um terry o'neill turned up to uh to to meet the beatles in 1963 and unbeknown to him they were just about to record she loves you you know so i, I figured out what day it was i figured out um exactly what guitars they were playing and 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 so captioning the photographs was the the big task in that one and that took you know a, a few months 
Unbelievable. Tony, now I've got to say, that's a beautiful book, the one with the photos as well. Now, mm. we've got you here today because I want the world to listen to this story that I only caught on to now, and that's why I got you on the show. Yeah. So Vicky's going to ask you the big question. I want all the Beatle people out there and everyone around the world to listen to this story because it's the first time that I heard of it. And as soon as I heard about it, I go, right, we're going to get Tony and talk about this to the world. So what is the big question? Tony, can you tell us if Elvis secretly visited London in 1958 or 59 without anybody knowing about that visit? I suspect that is true, Vicky. I suspect that Elvis did come all the way to London uh, and um, and maybe he wasn't noticed, maybe he was noticed. Uh, he was shown around, uh, the story goes, by Tommy Steele. Now, Tommy Steele was a big rock and roller in uh, in in Britain at the time. He'd, um, in 1957, he had a big number one hit with uh, Singing the Blues. Um, uh, and uh, he'd had lots of other um, huge hit singles. And he was really well known. And he did stage shows, pantomimes, you know, he did things like that. He was he was a sort of theatre star as, as well as a, as a rock and roll star. And um, the story goes that he got a call out of the blue from Elvis, Elvis Presley ringing, you know, from Memphis or something. And, and you couldn't believe it. He'd never spoken to Elvis in his life. It's the king of rock and roll was, was, was speaking to him. And Elvis apparently wanted to, uh, to be shown around London. He thought Tommy would be the ideal guy to do it. And, he, he, and Tommy said, of course, you can't say no, can you? He said yes. <laughs> and, and duly showed, you know, the king of rock and roll around one of the greatest cities in the world. And, um, you know, they probably had a bit of a sing song together. They probably, you know, sang a bit of jailhouse rock. I can imagine them doing that. Uh, I don't know if Elvis brought his guitar. We don't know. The, the, this, this story came out of a radio interview back in 2008. Um, Bill Kenwright, who's a well-known and very successful theatre producer in, in Britain, he uh, was talking to a broadcaster called Ken Bruce, uh, and he was, just happened to mention that Tommy had shared this story with him. This story, you know, the phone call, that, that you know, that the whole business of showing Elvis around London, and uh, it, it was it was just mind blowing to hear this. Um, and uh, of course, the the British press were all over it the next day. They wanted to know is this true? They were sending, they were uh, getting in touch with Tommy. I mean, what a lot of them did was. I mean, Tommy had published his autobiography two years before, 2006, Bermondsey Boy. It's a good read, actually. It's, a, it's good fun if you want to know about the rock and roll at that time. Uh, and he, uh, there's no mention of Elvis in that book. There's no mention of, well, there, Elvis is mentioned, but he, there's no mention of this, you know, I showed Elvis around in 1958. Wow. There's, in fact, there's, a, there's a big gap in that period and you so think what, what, oh, what do, you, do you anyway, think anyway a lot of journalists sorry sorry vicky so do you think he he if he did visit do you think it was for a day or would it have been for longer than the day i i suspect it was a day maybe a day and a half i mean it's 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 a short time to come for isn't it i mean if you you've got a long trip over from the from the us but he was you know for for a lot a large part of 1958 and 1959 he was stationed in West Germany because he was yes. uh, he was called up and uh, he was uh, uh, part of the U.S. Army and he was yes. stationed in West Germany. So it's not not too uh, unlikely, I think, that he travelled from Germany to to London. I mean, in 1959, he did travel from Germany to to Paris. He explored Paris a couple of times. In 1960, he explored Paris again. You know, so why? Why is it so unbelievable that he he didn't that he came to London? I, I think he did. Um, Not possible, yeah. Anyway, the press were all over this this interview in two thousand eight, and and uh, I, Tommy probably got fed up with being badgered. You know, he was he was a, a guy in his early seventies then. He's eighty four now, and um, he sent a message to the Daily Mail newspaper saying it was an event shared by two young men sharing the same love of their music and the same thrill of achieving something unimaginable. Oh, that's I wonderful. swore never to divulge publicly what took place 
and I regret that it has found some way of getting into the light. Now, so he's, he told Elvis, I'll never tell anybody about this. This is completely between you and me and, and the, the gatepost. And, um, you know, we're not going to, it's going to be secret. Now, I don't know exactly why Elvis wanted it to be kept secret. Maybe he'd gone AWOL from the army. That's an option. Um, maybe he just thought, if I come to London and don't tell any of my fans, they're going to be really upset and, uh, you know, and, and, and write to me and, and say, what, you came to London and you didn't, you didn't give me a handshake or a kiss or whatever, you know. So I think um, there were plenty of reasons why Elvis might have wanted it to be kept secret. But the strange thing was that at the end of this letter, Tommy said, you know, I, ha I really hope that Elvis can forgive me. Now, this is 2008. Elvis has been dead for since 1977. Um, so either Tommy believes in the afterlife or, or Elvis is still alive or, or, you know, it's a strange thing, isn't it? But he, he the, the promise extended beyond um, the death of the King of Rock and Roll, which is really interesting. That is um, very interesting. Tommy That's hasn't said anything about it. Story. That's an unbelievable story in itself. And I'm saying, if Tommy still wanted to come on the show with us, the three of us, and actually talk about the experience, he's more than welcome. Because as I said, you're talking about Elvis going to Paris a few times. I mean, you've mm. got to understand, he's a young man. He wants yeah. to go and see things at that particular time in his life. And he's got the freedom to do it. And maybe he didn't want to upset the colonel or he didn't want anyone to know and he wanted to go low-key and not yeah. make a big yeah. deal about it. Yeah, he was. Elvis was in his early 20s. You know, he was, he was full of energy. I'm sure he, 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 you know, why wouldn't he have come to London? So well, if anybody knows, you know, there might be somebody out there who's who's got pictures or, or saw Elvis in London. What do you think? Now, what we do is... Well, that's a great idea. Can we, can we do it? Can we have this challenge put out there to the whole world? Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. If anyone out there is listening to this show and has any uh, information about um, Elvis Presley's visit to London in that period, 1958-59, any photos, any stories where you may have met him at a pub or a, um, yeah. at, a, at a key uh, venue yeah. or a key area? Uh, you might have seen a very, very handsome area. dark man eating jelly deals and drinking brown <laughs> ale. You know, uh, please, yeah. please let us know. Victorian Send Batman. us a message and yeah. uh, we'll have you on the show as well and you can talk about it uh, with us. It'd be great if we, if we get a breakthrough like that. That's fantastic. What happens is if we get a breakthrough, evidence... We get them on the show. As I said, stories are stories. We can't just go on stories. But if someone's got hard evidence, a photo, that would yeah. get them on the show. You know what I mean? We need evidence to prove it. Now, I think there's no reason why it's not highly likely that he went there, but we need some proof. And if some somebody might have met him and actually taken a photo without him even knowing and recognised him, we yeah. don't know. Yeah. He might have actually stopped and said hello to somebody. We don't know. Absolutely. Um, they may have done it from the, you know, Bill Kenwright said at one point that they might have just done the whole thing in a car, just gone around and said, here's the House, House of Commons, here's, here's Buckingham Palace. And Elvis was looking from, but, but even then, somebody might have seen him. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's not hard to see Elvis, Somebody would have seen them. <laughs> it's not hard seeing Elvis. To me, it's a fascinating story. I'll tell you why. I've not heard about this story until a week well, ago. It, and it could even I be a cab you, driver. You know, it could even be a cab driver who was taking them around for the day. Yeah, that's the, that's a strange thing. It's it's been it's been around since two thousand and eight. This story, but nobody's um, refuted it. Nobody's proved it false or true or anything. But but it's still out there, you know. So I tend to believe it. Yeah. Well, as I said, if anyone's got any evidence, photos. That's what we need. We need some kind of hard evidence. And if you've got it. Get to us, just send us a message that you got something. You never know what's going to come up. That's what it yeah. is. The world is that fascinating that, you know, imagine a picture with Elvis or imagine taking a photo of Elvis with Tommy Steele. Someone's got that. How do you know? Yeah, yeah. That would be an that amazing would be a story. To see. <laughs> I just hope Elvis isn't too upset himself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm saying is we love the king, and as I said, this we is love like, the king, absolutely. We love the king, yeah. and you know, to know that he actually went, and he might not have even told the colonel. He said, "Look, I don't want to hassle," and he just went on his own. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think he would have loved London as well. I think it's a great, great city. Uh, he might have come here in the winter and shivered a bit, but, you know, I, I think uh, I think he would have enjoyed it. Well, if he had leave from the army and they said, look, you got two weeks leave and he's thinking of himself on board, right? I've got nothing yeah. to do. I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah. That, it makes yeah, sense to me because that was the time he could do it. He couldn't do it after that. No, no. Yeah, June June 1958 was good because he had two weeks furlough, I think, in the army and from the army, and uh, he could have come over here quite easily. Even if he took a boat, you know, he could have done it. As I said, someone might have flew him. He might have come. Somebody, yeah, he, he might have known yeah. somebody with a plane. You know, I mean, he had lots of contacts. Somebody with a plane could have helped him out for a friend, you know, who happened to have a flying license. I bet he knew a few of those. <laughs> Well, Tony, all I want to say is if you've got any other fascinating stories <laughs> like that, please let us know right here because today it's been riveting for me. And I don't yeah. know how you feel, Vicky, but I, I've ne I haven't been able to sleep since I heard the story. <laughs> oh, no, well, I, I'm very fascinated with this story and uh, very excited to be promoting your book here. Thank Tony. you very much. <laughs> and as I said, Tony, you. if anything yeah. comes through, we'll be the first yeah. to know. And you'll see it here on the Plastic EP and Vicky show. Yeah, that, yeah, Tony, yeah, that's good in touch. As I Let's... said, I just hope something surfaces. Like, yeah, that yeah. could be like, how many times have we heard of the Beatles? They've gone <laughs> somewhere and someone's invited them to their home. And they've gone, sat down, had a meal, and they've got the photos to show, to prove it. Yeah, yeah. Well, fingers crossed. Let's, um, yep. let's confirm that Elvis that's made that it. trip. <laughs> All There's the best. a challenge out there for everybody. <laughs> if anybody knows anything, let us know. And if you've got pictures or evidence of something, sighting of, of Elvis in London in 1958 or 59, please let us know. Well, I can tell you something. I was born in 58 in July, so I never saw it. So, <laughs> No, no. It's, it's, you missed it by a month, Plastic. <laughs> before my time as well, you know. I was such a twinkle in the milkman's eye. <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks again everyone stay there tony thanks, thanks everyone Bonnie. make thanks sure everyone. you share this everyone knows in the world that there's a there's a possibility that elvis went to london in 1958 or 59 let's follow this story buy Tony's book. <laughs> thank you very That's much a great book. and the other one hold up the other one tony it's Beatlemania. Hold it up, Vicky, again. photographs from 63 to 65. Right. Buy them both because they're both great and books. If, right. if you're in Japan, go out and buy the Beatles. Oh, what, what's the book? On the road. On the roof. On the rooftop. Yeah, Beatles on the roof. Yeah, well, they're not on the road, Vicky. They're on a roof. Okay. <laughs> That's for all the Japanese fans out there. You can, Vicky, you give me an idea for another book. On the road. With the all right. The Stay again. there, Tony. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye, yeah, all Bye the best. everyone. Hey, baby, it's a king. We love you.